It's the week ending Saturday the 27th of March and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen Boris Johnson telling a group of Tory MPs the UK's successful vaccine rollout was thanks to greed. In Bristol, a demonstration against the policing and crime bill turning violent and Donald Trump announcing he'll soon be returning to social media because he's starting his own platform. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today, freelance journalist Sir Chandrika Chakrabarti from Money Week, Mr. John Stepek, and from the week's digital team, making her debut on the show, it is Sorsha Bradley. Hi, Sorsha. Hi, Ollie. Uh, please introduce yourself to our audience by telling us something about yourself we would not be able to discover just by Googling you. Mm, okay. I guess for a period of time when I was a child, um, I had two pet ducks. So that's my fact. Oh, that's okay. You introduced it very much like you would to a therapist, a more troubling fact. <laughs> <laughs> but that was quite wholesome. Uh, so, Chandrika, you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Don't reply to that dodgy text. There's a new scam here in the UK which has been very effective. It's people alleging to be sending you a package from HM Revenue and Customs and coming via Royal Mail. But as you can see, that's not the Royal Mail address. I almost got caught by it the other day. It's basically saying they tried to deliver a large letter to you but failed to do so, so now you should reschedule. Don't click on the link, it's bogus. The Fixed It channel on YouTube, aka a man called Malcolm, warning of a post office delivery scam in November. Uh, so Chandrika, what's happened this week? So this week we've had the news that the UK action fraud team says cases of COVID related fraud and cybercrime in England have shot up over lockdown. So there's been over 6,000 cases reported and £34.5 million has been stolen since the 1st of March 2020. And why are they saying that cases of fraud have gone up? Is it COVID related? Yeah, so it seems that scammers are taking advantage of the fact that people are stuck at home and really reliant on deliveries. So what we heard in that clip just now was a combination of a Royal Mail scam and an HMRC scam, so a tax scam. And those are two things that kind of, number one, Royal Mail has been delivering stuff to people who can't leave their homes. And number two, HMRC, obviously, taxes had to be done differently this year, particularly for freelancers, because business has been quite bad and, and all those sorts of things. And so we're waiting for communication from HMRC, from Royal Mail and so on. And so scammers are using that vulnerability and trying to get to us and get to our money. So this is people receiving SMSs or emails saying we're Royal Mail and what, we've got a package from HMRC, so what? You click a link and you're actually giving your details to a fraudster. Well, I actually had both scams tried on me, one this morning and one a couple of weeks ago. One this morning? One this wow. morning, Ollie. Like, it's this morning unwrapped. The news never stops. <laughs> so the one this morning was from was apparently from HMRC. I got a robocall, so my phone rang, and it was also vibrating in, a, in an odd way, and it didn't stop vibrating when I picked up, which is a bit of a, a sign. And so it's HMRC calling up and saying they had opened a fraud case in my name and to be honest with you it was before 9am and I just thought they don't work this early <laughs> and put the phone down and then the other one that's been in the news because some people lost a lot of money to it is a supposed text from Royal Mail saying that you've got a delivery coming your way but it needs some extra payment so can you pay Royal Mail £2.99 and here's a link and so on and you're meant to put in your bank details and then that's how the scammers sort of get you in so I received that text a few weeks ago and to be honest, my, my thought was just like, how does Royal Mail have my phone number? They won't text me. And I just deleted it. Um, and I don't know why I had that reaction. I think the psychology is very interesting. But there is a Twitter thread from a user called Emmeline Hartley um, who put it up the other day and just she lost all of her money, basically. And it's a really horrible scam. And people are very ashamed when, when they get taken in by it. Because her one, John, I read that Twitter thread as well was something that started small, as in she gave her credit card details to a fraudster realized immediately and cancelled the credit card and you'd think that would be it but what they very cleverly did is pretended to be her bank and called her up saying we've identified fraud on your account move your money into another account and before she knew it she'd emptied her life savings into their bank account yeah they do that a lot it's um it comes in a couple of formats i mean i've seen it with investments and what happened to one chap that i actually knew was that 
basically he got coined by a, a, a dodgy trading service uh, where they, they phone you up out of the blue and promise you a brilliant investment return and if they catch you at the, the right time um, because this happens to intelligent, you know, perfectly intelligent people who've in sometimes quite sophisticated investors you fall for it, you send them whatever kind of like a few grand, um, maybe you send them a few grand more and then they milk you for all they can get and then after that what happens is once you realise you've been ripped off, somebody else phones you up pretending to be a fraud recovery company and says if you give us an upfront payment of five grand say We'll get your returns back, and we've we've the other thing they do is they say we looked into this this company and it's a real company and they really have made these investments and all that money that you invested that you thought you lost well it's actually doubled because the investment has gone up in that time, but in order for us to process the paperwork etc you'll need to give us an upfront payment of you know x y z thousand, and because people feel so bad about being ripped off in the first place, they often fall for the the kind of fraud recovery scam, even though to most of us that seems very obvious too. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's playing on people's sense of shame at being uh, ripped off. But in this case, it was, you know, it wasn't so much that, it was just it was just a very convincing and sophisticated fraud. But most people, I guess, Saoirse, probably fall at the first hurdle, give their credit card details, then realise, and don't follow up by giving all of their money to a fraudster. And from that point of view, I guess some people think, well, it's sort of a victimless crime in the sense that in most cases, credit card companies will refund you for that error, you're protected. And that doesn't seem to take account for how people feel. I mean, you see people interviewed and they're absolutely devastated just as they would be if their house was burgled. No, I think that's right. I think the emotional impact um, is often one of the most devastating parts of being scammed. And I think that kind of leads you to feeling like a kind of lack of trust in what are otherwise kind of everyday incidences like getting a text, checking your emails. And, you know, I think what's interesting is that I think lots of people kind of assume that it's maybe only older people who are more prone to falling for these scams and certainly I think there has been an increase in older people being targeted by this these scams but actually there is evidence to, to suggest that under 25s are, are also quite prone to falling for these scams so people who are under 25 are 84 percent more likely to be targeted uh, than those in the next age group up so it's it's kind of something that affects a huge uh, range of people and I think especially you know if you're quite young and you're being targeted you don't necessarily have the kind of experience to realize what's happening to you and it, I think emotionally as well for young people it can be it can be really difficult. And yet John just one percent of police resources are committed to dealing with this uh, and law enforcement admits that fewer than three percent of cases are likely to end in a positive outcome like a suspect being charged or prosecuted. Do, do you think the authorities need to do more about fraud? Um I, th- I think that's a really tricky question. I mean, I think it's absolutely true that the resources dedicated to it are completely inadequate. Um, you know, action fraud can can do virtually nothing. These are the people you report stuff to scams to these people, and then what they're meant to do is kind of like parcel them up among police forces. But the actual police forces themselves then don't you know pursue it. I mean, part of the problem is though that there, there are so many ways to scam people. For example, the FCA, again, this is the financial regulator, has got a great big list of scams and types of scam and dodgy companies that are usually impersonating someone else. So a lot of the time you'll get calls or you'll see kind of like websites where companies have given themselves like an almost city-ish sounding name. They might kind of like call themselves, I don't know, Goldman Stanley Asset Management or something. Do you know what I mean? They kind of, they make them sound a bit kind of posh. But there are some ways, aren't there, Sachandrika, to protect yourself that are actually quite simple. I mean, in that video that we played from YouTube where the chat was explaining how to stop falling prey to the post office scam, he showed that if you simply just right click on the email address that the email appears to have come from, you know, it presents itself in your inbox as Post Office Limited or something, you right click and you see that it's a .us email address. So even someone with a very basic understanding of how the country uh, is, is structured would know that probably isn't the post office. What else can we do to protect ourselves? So even if you don't want to click on anything, because you might be worried about viruses and so on, um, the easiest thing to do is to talk to someone. But we kind of have lost that in a socially distanced time, and that might be what's helping scammers. So other things you can do is Google just straight away any of the details of the scam from the phone number that rings you. So this 
HMRC robocall. They used an 0207 number. Like, that makes it seem much more legitimate, but it's definitely a scam. So I Googled the details of the scam. See what's online. See if it matches what you had happened to you. And also see if there's somewhere that um, you can get more advice. Then protect yourself from further risk. So cancel cards, close accounts, make sure they can't get any more of your money or impersonate you any further. Check you can get your money back. So get on the phone to your bank. They will try to be as helpful as possible. Hopefully you will be able to recover the money, but there can be that can take time. And report the scam online. So with the HMRC one this morning, I went online. There's a .gov.uk web address where I could go and report it. And they just needed some information. I had it right there. And now they've got another example. Goldman Stanley wanted the details. I gave them to them. He's a friend from uni. What can I say? I trust him with my money. <laughs> and Sorcia, it seems to me there's maybe a role for what you do here, digital journalism, uh, in the... You know, some of the very sort of clickbaity articles, you know, what time is Asda going to be open on Christmas Eve? You know, it's very easy to criticise that kind of journalism. But actually for this kind of thing, like, is this number a real number or not? You could you could write a, an infinite number of articles explaining, yes, this is fraud. And the fact it came from a brand name like The Week or The Guardian or The Telegraph, or whoever it is, would actually help dispel some of these myths, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And I actually think um, what I've been surprised to see is that these scams have been uh, making it into the national newspapers and public service journalism is always a good thing. And if uh, newspapers are looking for ways in which they can positively impact people's lives and be a direct help in this case, then that is definitely something I think be useful if there was more coverage on. So what's the cleverest bit of psychology that you've seen, Sachandrika, looking into this in terms of how people get their victims lured in. Yeah, because as we've mentioned, it's all kinds of people. It's not about age or education level or anything like that. It's more about emotional intelligence, really, isn't it? And so they pose as friends, as people who are helpful to us. So I'd say they're kind of like five main areas. There's the give and take kind of way that if someone helps us, they give us an exclusive opportunity. Um, they're giving us a favour. We want to say yes and we want to be involved. And um, there's claims of popularity. So if the person on the end of the phone says, 75% of people I've rung have said yes to this scheme, we want to be part of the majority rather than the minority who said no. Um, fraudsters get us to commit to like little steps and then escalate. So we start off with like, oh, when's your birthday? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, so is my mother's. And there's this feeling of similarity and that we're speaking to a real person who cares about us. Then this FOMO, classic, we're all feeling FOMO, fear of missing out. So if the person on the end of the phone is like, this this um, offers any valid until we put the phone down, we might be more likely to go, yes, I'll take it. And the last one is this kind of, um, script they get us to commit to. So again, we kind of know that we give um, little details and then it goes further, who do you bank with? Then it goes further, how long, how many accounts? And then we give away more and more information without feeling that we have. It's very incremental. So that's the kind of psychological reasons that it can work on anyone. Yeah, so actually the script is interesting, isn't it? Because again, that's, the, the cliche is someone sitting there in another country and you can tell from the way they speak English that they're just, you know, somehow not connecting with you. It's not like that now. I mean, the script is quite complex. The screen grabs that I've seen, there are, you know, it's like someone working in a legit call centre where if the person says this, you say that, and the script is written to disarm people's psychology. I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? I think lots of us like to think that we've become quite aware of what the, the scams are and maybe wouldn't fall for like the traditional email scams anymore, we'd like to think. But actually, they've moved on from that. They look very different. I'm not sure how prevalent it would be was to kind of be scammed over text before very recently and the ability to clone phone numbers as well where they seem to be coming from legitimate phone numbers so i think it, there is kind of a sh almost a shift in uh, perception that we all need to have to actually be able to recognize these scams because i mean i got the uh royal mail text as well and you know i won't lie i was expecting a package it didn't look out of place to me to get a uh, text like that at all. And it was, you know, I clicked on the link, the worst thing you could possibly do. And it was only when I was about to enter my details that something went off in my head and was like, wait, hang on, why, <laughs> why would this be happening? Why would they have my details? Why would they have my phone number? So I think we need to think about these scams very differently and think about how, just how different they look now. It, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, good discussion. Uh, I'd like to share it all with you later, actually. So if you could just on the Zoom chat, post me your date of birth and your email address, that'd be really helpful. <laughs> um, John, you're up next after this. Um, 
Okay, John, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Is this as good as it gets for the stock market? Stock set to fall at the open as futures overnight hitting their limit down levels once again. This is one of the first times, I think, Andrew, that the uh, Federal Reserve has announced something and the market has actually gone up. This is an urgent situation for Congress to pass this, but we are ready and we are working with the Fed to provide unprecedented liquidity. We looked like we were going to be down, then we looked like we might open much higher as a result of the Fed action, and now I'm trying to figure out where things are going to stand. The sell-off is deepening as we move throughout the session today. The Dow is now down more than 900 points. We're very close to reaching a deal. Very close. A video shared by CNBC on Tuesday recapping their coverage from a year prior. Um, John, coronavirus caused a significant market drop. We know that much. But now there are some surprising statistics. Yeah, I mean, I think if you'd asked the average person this time last year how the stock market would have done a year later, and I'm including people like myself and financial people in this, they'd have probably been a bit cagey about giving you a response. And as it turns out, do you want to take a guess, Ollie? <laughs> how much is up? <laughs> well... I know that I asked you a year ago <laughs> off mic what you thought was going on and I remember you put the fear of God into me because you said it was one of the last times that we met face to face before we all went into remote working of course and you said something along the lines of why is everyone behaving like the sky isn't falling in you know I've, I've come up to record the podcast on the sixth floor and when I walk outside or when I look at my computer monitor I'm getting constant text saying everything is imploding <laughs> But that's yeah. what I would have predicted. <laughs> I'm a terrible scaremonger. As it turns <laughs> out, the stock, US stock market has just had its literally its best year on record. Uh, so the S&P 500, which is their equivalent to the FTSE, is up by more than 70%. And just for perspective, um, if you made like a gain of 10% in a year, that would normally be seen as a good year. So this has been nothing short of a spectacular year, basically, for people who own stocks. So... I mean, you're going to just have to dumb this down really very severely for me. Are you saying that if you actually had an investment in those companies that are in the S&P 500, you will have gained 70%? Yes, you would almost have. If you'd bought them on the day that Britain actually had its official lockdown, then you would have pretty much made, well, almost doubled your money um, over the past year. Okay, so if you bought them on the low? Yes. Right. Because, yeah, I've got this quote here from James McIntosh of the Wall Street Journal. He wrote this time last year here. The true contrarian only buys when it makes him feel physically sick to press the buy key. At the moment, I not only feel sick at the idea, but want to disinfect the keyboard before using it. Does that mean it's time to buy? So yes, basically, whilst John Sepek was saying the sky's about to fall in, that's when we all should have bought stock. Exactly, exactly. I put my hands up. I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sorcha, this may seem like a kind of quirky story. Oh, look, it's rebounded. It's also kind of distasteful, isn't it? I mean, some people say this is exactly what is wrong with capitalism, basically. You've got the greatest threat to humanity of the century, and it was a great opportunity to buy, to invest. Yeah, you know, obviously, in the UK, a lot of people are suffering over the effects of the pandemic. A lot of people are on furlough or um, have lost their jobs. So I think uh, it will certainly come to a surprise to millions of people that actually some people are doing well out of uh, what is a particularly kind of dark period of, of our history. But some industries, of course, are doing well out of um, the pandemic. Pharmaceutical companies, of course, e-commerce businesses, food and groceries. So I think those companies doing well was almost in inevitable in uh, kind of the situation that we found ourselves in where we can't leave our homes and we can't go to work. And so we've come to rely on those things. So fair enough. That's not a surprise, John. But I'm looking at a list of greater than 100% returns over the past year that I found on Bloomberg, and it has on it airlines and hotels, restaurants and leisure. What? I mean... <laughs> How have people made money out of those sectors when they're literally closed? Well, I think this is where it's worth understanding how the stock market works. And basically, the, the point of the stock market is almost it processes information. So whenever the COVID broke out, nobody really understood how bad it was going to get. And the thing is, once people do understand just how bad it's going to get, then that's priced in. And they start to think, okay, well, how can it get better from here? So one of the reasons that contrarian investing works, and that's the thing where um, there's an apocryphal quote from one of the uh, from Baron Rothschild, which is um, 
by on the sound of cannons and uh, selling the sound of applause or something like that. And there's another one which is by when there's blood in the streets. Um, and this is whenever whenever people feel so gloomy and they're at rock bottom, things can only get better. So when things get slightly less bad, you know, stocks can start to recover. And basically that's what happened with airlines. So what happened was the COVID broke out. Nobody knew what was going to happen if we'd ever be flying again. And then we started to get a little bit of visibility on just how bad it was. China, I mean, I think it's easy to forget, but China was starting to come out of it even as we were going into lockdown. So people could see that this was, it wasn't going to kill everyone in the world. At some point, the economy would go back to normal. So really, it just came, became a matter of, well, how long is that going to take? So Chandrika, why do you think the rebound has been so strong then? Well, it's an interesting one. I've got two ideas here. So the first one um, came out of reading this Bloomberg opinion piece by John Authors. He says it's still extraordinary that the pandemic has been so terrible, yet so much wealth has been created. So certainly um, you've got these fault lines where COVID has uncovered the huge inequality between the rich and the poor. And it just seems that the stock market is kind of capitalising on that. The kind of people who have the money to play the stock market probably realised at some point that COVID was disproportionately affecting poor people and they might have felt quite safe. And there is the other thing we've not mentioned, because I wonder if we don't dare to say this name anymore. It's not Voldemort. It's Is this a post-Trump bounce back? So we've just had an extraordinary leader in the negative sense of the word, leave office, and then we have this gigantic bounce back in terms of the stock market. So is there renewed hope because we have a new administration in the White House? I have a feeling John's going to say no, but let's hear <laughs> Um, the Trump thing, no, but that's, I mean, it's only because politics doesn't actually, weirdly enough, it doesn't affect the market that much. Um, and actually the market shot up while Trump was around. Basically, the only thing that the market cared about with Trump was that he cut taxes for companies. And to be fair, the only thing the market cares about with Biden is that he's going to spend a load of public money, which is also good for the stock market because it means more money floating around the, uh, the, the kind of economy. But no, the main thing actually is partly what you heard in that mix at the start, which is that the Federal Reserve, which is the most important central bank in the world, basically came out and did a whole load of things that it had never done before, which included printing money to buy the debt of companies that could otherwise have gone bust. So what happened is that everyone realised that, OK, whatever happens, it's not going to turn into 2008 again. I know, sorry, I've mentioned 2008 again. Right. But I've just won a tenner. At that point, <laughs> at that point the, um, you know, the whole financial system could have collapsed and that could have happened with COVID as well. But as soon as the Fed came in, it's almost like underwriting the market is saying, look, this is the worst thing that can happen. So you're saying that the investments that happened, the, the government investments that happened that enabled the banks to respond to all this preemptively, None of that would have happened if we hadn't had 2008. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. If we hadn't... So what happened in 2008 is that the central banks started printing money. And at the time, that was incredibly controversial. It was like, good, you know, this is like Zimbabwe. This is, this is madness. As it turned out, we then had 12 years of kind of relatively weak growth. So we all started to believe that central banks could print as much money as they wanted and it wouldn't be a problem. So what happened is that whenever... COVID caused the economy to get shut down. Central banks went straight to what they'd done in 2008 and just amped it up even further. So in a way, it's weird. I mean, 2008 wasn't a dry run for this because obviously it's an entirely, there's two entirely different types of crisis. But this one could easily have caused a banking collapse because, like, put it this way, if you shut down the airlines and you don't give them any support, then they would have gone bust. Loads of people would have been fired loads of bad debts would have come into the system and the whole thing would have been, yeah, it would have collapsed. Whereas by keeping companies on life support during this period, they haven't had to lay off as many people. They've been able to service their debts. And so it's almost like putting the, the economy into deep freeze rather than, you know, just letting it crumble. So sure we're only one year in. You know, I mean, John's talking like this is all over just because, you know, in Britain we've got a vaccine rollout and whatever. But I mean, some industries are going to die now, aren't they? And this, this, if you took this as your only news source, <laughs> you'd have an unrepresentatively optimistic view about that. Yeah, I think some industries are going to find it very difficult to recover. For example, um, the arts industries. People have not been able to go to the theatre, go to, you know, the cinema, go to concerts. And that, you know, will have, I think, a, lo a long term effect in they won't necessarily be able to pick up where they left off and there 
almost definitely will be kind of social distancing measures in place for a long time. And especially theatres, they need a lot of people to even break even in theatres. And it's a massive question about over how they'll ever, it, well, at least in the next couple of years, get to the point where they are able to fill those seats and, and make money and be able to continue. So, um, yeah, I think there are plenty of industries which will be devastated and take it could take decades for them to get back to where they were. And property portfolios is another one that springs to mind to Chandrika. It's a bit of a pet subject for you on this show over the past few months, hasn't it? But, you know, this idea that people are moving out to the suburbs and, you know, rival studies that say, oh, property values are up, property values are down. I mean, if your business was running a load of big office buildings in London, you'd be a bit worried. It's, it's hard to know. You're getting lots of different kinds of conflicting advice on what's happening to the market. But generally, if this has happened with the stock market, so up 70% in the US, 60% in the UK, it does seem like house prices, like the bottom end are going up even more. So it would just be even harder for first time buyers to break into that market. But in terms of people who are already in that market, it's just going up and up. Okay, Saoirse, I'm coming to you next after this. Okay, Saoirse, you are ending the show this week. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Has androgynous fashion finally become mainstream? Ooh, yes. And when it comes to fashion, Harry tells Vogue, clothes are there to have fun with and experiment with and play with. What's really exciting is that all of these lines are just kind of crumbling away. When you take away there's clothes for men and there's clothes for women, once you remove any barriers, obviously you open up the arena in which you can play. I'll go and shop sometimes and I just find myself looking at the women's clothes thinking they're amazing. It's like anything. Anytime you're putting barriers up in your own life, you're just limiting yourself. There's so much joy to be had in playing with clothes. I've never really thought too much about what it means. It just becomes this extended part of creating something. Keshi Ashante from ET Canada quoting Harry Styles, or just Harry to her, uh, after he appeared on the cover of Vogue wearing a dress. Uh, Saoirse, lockdown has, has sparked a, a whole range of new fashion trends, hasn't it? Loungewear, long hair, pyjama bottoms. Uh, and you're here to tell us that the next one is men's skirts. Yeah, well, this week, The Guardian was discussing whether men's skirts was finally kind of in fashion, in mainstream fashion. In the uh, autumn and winter collections, we've seen a lot of um, kind of what would be considered traditionally um, women's clothes modelled on men. Um, We've seen that in uh, Burberry collections, Louis Vuitton, J.W. Anderson, and increasingly, obviously, the uh, very famously now um, Harry Styles Vogue cover but we see lots of celebrities kind of embracing wearing dresses or skirts like Post Malone or Young Blood these are people who are very popular with young people Gen Z. Yeah so the question is you know when a pop icon does it does it necessarily trickle down because you know David Bowie did it 40 50 years ago but that didn't necessarily lead to an explosion of men who don't buy their clothes from Louis Vuitton <laughs> wearing dresses. You know, I didn't I don't see super dry stocking dresses. Yeah, I mean I think that's that's a great point. I think it's one thing for kind of these big fashion houses to um be in, introducing uh men's skirts and as you say it has actually it's been done for years but I think what um kind of the Harry Styles cover shows and that it has been included in so many uh, collections is that it, is that, uh, you know, kind of gender non-conforming clothing and um, gender neutral clothing is entering mainstream consciousness in a much uh, greater way than it has before. It's not simply something that's was quite transgressive and a bit arty. It's actually becoming something that could see mainstream success. And I think that point, yes, it will, it w- will come when, you know, men's skirts are being advertised in ASOS or, you know, uh, mainstream stream high high street shops. Then I think we can say yes, it's finally finally it really has entered the mainstream. But until then, yes, there's a question. I mean, even if it has Sir and even if it has for a certain age of man who is roughly Harry Styles' age, uh, it strikes me still as sort of going out where. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, I mean, what we're talking about here is is men who previously wouldn't be interested in any kind of gender bending, right? That's the change. Like, there's always been men who have been transvestites and men who have been interested in expressing their sexuality through clothes. But what we're talking about here is, would young straight men go to a nightclub wearing a dress? Maybe. 
But that doesn't mean they're going to go to work that way. Well, number one, will nightclubs come back anytime soon? <laughs> will there be anywhere for them to go? <laughs> I, I would love to go there and see men wearing dresses. That'd be great. But um, if we go back to that Guardian article, I think there's some really interesting points made in there. Firstly, about how skirts are freeing. So guys who've tried out skirts have said they're really freeing, which I think is a really interesting way of talking about skirts because for women, we've kind of made a thing of giving up on workwear in the pandemic and wanting to wear joggers and finding workwear restrictive and not freeing and kind of they almost it says too much about you what you choose to wear to work as a woman so often they're not very freeing for women that made me think about like the politics of dressing there's a quote from Andrew Groves, the director of the Westminster Menswear Archive at the University of Westminster and the Guardian piece. And he says, to become truly mainstream, men's skirts would need to combine the pencil skirt with a multi-pocketed work trouser. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm getting at. Could you, could you imagine it in the workplace? <laughs> so firstly, like none of these men are wearing pencil skirts, which are tight. They're generally wearing like A-line skirts, a bit like a kilt, a bit like a netball skirt. So you don't have that sexualized kind of skirt. It's more like it's a piece of clothing that doesn't have two separate legs. So it, it doesn't tend to be that sexualized. And secondly, Professor Graves is saying that the skirt on its own is not enough for men. It needs to have pockets. Now, women are wearing skirts without pockets forever. Why don't we get to have pockets? I have a pockets rant to go on. Just let me know when you want it. I'm, I'll have it now. Okay. Why, why, why do you need... I mean... Who's stopping you get a pocket? I'm not. No, Ollie, man, you yourself aren't. Although if I could blame the stock market, I would. And um, <laughs> there have been a few text messages about it. But basically, I found this really great piece called The Politics of Pockets by Chelsea Summers on Vox.com. And we go back to Christian Dior in 1954. He was a great quote about it. He says, men have pockets to keep things in, women for decoration. So he's really talking about that binary sort of gender stereotype. Men can do one thing, women can do another. There are other restrictions on what we can do, but that's essentially what it is. Men's dresses for utility, women's for beauty. And so the less women can carry, the less freedom we have. If we can't carry keys, phone, money all in one go, we're much more vulnerable out in public. And that's that's been a general conversation in the UK media for the last couple of weeks. And so we go to um, one more piece in New York Times, 1899. As we become more civilised, we need more pockets, this piece says. No pocketless people has ever been great since pockets were invented. And the female sex cannot rival us, meaning men, while it's pocketless. So in a way, it kind of is quite oppressive to wear clothes for the silhouette and not the pockets when you're female. So the skirt freeing men should also free women and people who do not identify as either gender. Uh, We've mentioned the kilt, John. Um, You're a Scot. I can't see your bottom half right now. I assume it's trousered. Are you partial? Kilts are great. And I think that Actually, Sasha Chandrika's point about pockets there was actually very important because my daughters always complain about the absence of pockets on, uh, you know, girls' clothes. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, kilts are great and they are comfortable. And I would say a freeing is actually a very good description because your legs don't feel restricted. Because if you're wearing jeans, I mean, you know, jeans are very comfortable, but actually whenever you swap them for a, a skirt-type garment, then, you know, it's like wearing shorts. You know, so, and, and, and also, it's obviously it's not tight around, you know, your private parts at the end of the day. So, it's, um, so yeah, no, I mean, I can see why men kind of find it free. And at the same time, you know, as you say, we're not wearing pencil kilts. We're wearing kind of like great big kind of things that are wrapped around us. And I mean, I think looking at the, the long term history of clothes, then, you know, I mean, if you, you look at Roman centurions, they're all wearing skirts, um, effectively, you know, tunics. Um, is it was a perfectly normal thing to wear, and there's plenty of countries where it's a perfectly normal thing to wear. I mean, I think the fashion thing obviously is just. I mean, fashion is superficial, but I mean, it's superficiality incarnate. That's the point of it. And you know, having somebody like Harry wearing a dress. I mean, all the people like Burberry and all the rest that want to do is open up new markets. It's like the way they keep trying to sell men lipstick and moisturizer. You know, if you can make half of the population feel as insecure as you've already made the other half feel, then we'll be <laughs> buying lots of rubbish to make ourselves look better as well. Well, maybe. I mean, I think it, to me it's like a kind of extreme example, Saoirse, of of like what Harry Styles himself talked about in that Vogue article, which is as a man when you go into the store, some of the materials, some of the fabrics that women get to choose from are just that bit more interesting and exciting. And so like it's a very dramatic representation of that you know, to wear a big floral bride's dress. But, I mean, the point it's making is, why should it be that things made out of feathers are just for women? 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting that Harry Styles, as for that cover in particular, you know, he was the um, first solo male to go on the cover of US Vogue, which is traditionally a women's magazine. And what he did is, you know, choose to celebrate um, women's clothing, which, you know, makes up the probably the majority of of the uh, fashion industry. And I think actually, I'm not sure it is about... um, tapping into insecurity I think what's what's being done is that he is tapping into his audience's willingness to kind of explore their identity explore gender fluidity explore kind of the boundaries of what isn't isn't acceptable in terms of um clothing you know traditionally which I don't think that is something that is new rock stars have always done that You know, David Bowie on the cover of uh, The Man Who Sold the World wore a Mr. Fish dress, which, you know, Michael Fish was very influential um, in the 60s in introducing kind of men's skirts and men's dresses. But I think, yeah, Harry and kind of maybe the zeitgeist now is that young people, Gen Z in particular, don't want to be bound by kind of traditional expressions of identity and I think that's easy to see if you go on to apps like TikTok for example the trends that come from TikTok like for example e-boys I mean, we're all nodding I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> yeah. what's an e-boy sounds like one of the scams uh, yeah well you know and e-boys kind of present themselves uh, in a way that is kind of you know it's like softer it is more feminine and I so I think uh, there's but it's a trend is it it's like a like mods and rockers but for social video is that right I realize I now sound like your grandfather it is a trend traditionally really kind of you know men wearing skirts or men wearing dresses it's kind of you know it's trans transgressive and it can be quite political obviously we have to be able to you know we have to realize the huge role of lgbtq people in kind of introducing this as like a fashion a fashion trend like to ignore them would be you know would be remiss um so i think what the, the question really is is yes is it just a trend and kind of young people feel and young men who are maybe dressing in a more feminine way kind of feel almost protected by the fact that it's a trend and they kind of have that to hide behind and when the trend moves on they'll no longer dress like that or are we kind of permanently entering a period of kind of more fluid gender expression really it's hard to imagine Sachandrika, isn't it? Some of our more senior men wearing skirts. I mean, if Boris Johnson wore a skirt to a press conference, it would break the internet, wouldn't it? Same for Joe Biden. Same for the. I was about to say same for the Pope, but I suppose he does sort of wear a skirt in a way, doesn't he, with the traditional robes? But you know what I mean. It's it's harder to imagine older figures, less sexualized figures than pop stars buying into this anytime soon because it's also about power and status isn't it so harry styles has that power and status and that profession that he can create and play and he'll be photographed by u.s vogue and he'll be styled in an amazing way and i'd say he does look great like harry styles doesn't really crop up on my radar very often but he, he looks lovely and interesting and different and that's what fashion magazines need to project after a year of us all being on lockdown so i think for politicians i mean i think back to the the legsit front page of the daily mail when theresa may and nicola sturgeon's legs were highlighted and then also the whole kitten heel situation so um, back when i was at the mirror the politics guys did a really nice kind of rundown of let's look at male politicians shoes in the way that female politicians shoes are written about because theresa may's one main thing was she wore leopard print kitten heels that one time and that was before we got the dancing gifts of her of course which uh, was another great phase of her life but i think that when you already have the power you kind of have to dress to reinforce that power. And when you do have this kind of conservative job, like an older male statesman, then it is hard to play around with that image to that extent, I suppose. Having said that, if if Boris does want to try out a skirt, it could really change his image. Might not be a bad thing. I think with that thought, it's probably best that we finish up. <laughs> Beautifully presented. Thank you. Although, as I said, I can only see your top halves. Uh, that is it from me, Sir Chandrika John and Saoirse. Remember, you can subscribe to this show for free. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts. I do not care what you're wearing. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye. Bye-bye.